Hello, Contrarians listeners, watchers, fans all over the world. Here we are with a very special Facebook preview, I guess, preview YouTube video. We're going to be talking about the movie Waitress with a first-time guest on the show, Rachel Sulewinski. We've tried this before in previous mm -hmm. installments where her husband has guessed it. That's Ryan from Spit and Polish. It's a lot easier to say Ryan from Spit and Polish. I would like to see him try to say my last name just for the record. But anyway, Rachel, um, she's great. She saved us from being just two dudes talking about a very uh, woman-centric movie. Yeah. Uh, Waitress, directed by Adrian Shelley and uh, starring Carrie Russell. Uh, we're going to do the same thing that we always do here on these uh, previews. We're going to give you a few quotes. This movie's fresh, so a lot of fresh quotes from Tomato meter and uh, then Alex is going to give us some trivia and in between that we're going to try to figure out if we we can put Josh Gad in this movie. Uh, we were just discussing that it might be hard but that's never stopped us before. Where there's a Gad there's a way. Oh. <laughs> and Gad we trust as we've there said before. If you want to see Rachel well uh, tough luck because she's not in this video but she will join us for the entire episode. And now let's move on to the quotes. We're going to start with Richard Probst from the independentcritic.com, who says, it's hard to picture an actress other than Russell so beautifully blending the drama, desperation, hopefulness, sweetness, and sensuality of her character. And Alex, I'm going to couple that with uh, Jordan Hiller from bangitout.com. Jesus. <laughs> I dare you to sit through waitress and not fall for Russell. Her face is open like a baby's and sculpted like a goddess's. That's weird. I know. <laughs> I hadn't realized that the name of the website was bangitout.com until uh, I got there. But uh, a lot of love for Carrie Russell. Uh, definitely uh, a Carrie Russell vehicle, and there aren't that many of them. Uh, as we... I was about to say, is this like her? Is this her movie? This you think this is like? Um, I mean, that obviously it's her movie in the way it's written. Like she stars in it, but like, is this what everyone thinks of when they think of Carrie Russell? What was that show she was on? Felicity. That's right. I think, I don't know. I mean, let's poll listeners because when I think Gary Russell, I think Felicity. But that's basically my generation. I think that there might be a group of people that think um, the Americans. And I don't know that there's anybody that thinks of her movies firsthand. She's in a few, but I think that's the first one that I've seen where she's the lead. Cooking Bear in theaters now. Uh, I think she might be the lead on that one. Back at it. Yeah, her movie run is you know not as expansive but uh and mostly supporting roles right i know she's in uh one of the planet of the apes movies she was in rise of skywalker yeah but she's wearing a mask so you would never she's a uh, that bounty hunter that has a past relationship with poe dameron and oh uh, yeah she's always wearing her mask blocked most of her. that out um <laughs> don't blame you uh, i feel like this movie comes up a lot though and i mean it's going to when you're talking about carrie russell I would hope so. Because as we talk about in the episode, this was kind of a sleeper hit. And uh, a lot of that, much like the quotes you just read, centers around her performance. Yeah, I read a, a, an article where they were asking her why she wasn't in the Broadway adaptation of Waitress. And she very sincerely said, because I can't sing. <laughs> I would love to, <laughs> but I, I could never do it because I, my singing is terrible. She said, she's a dancer. And, and she's danced before in movies and so on, but she's not a singer. So good on Carrie Russell for knowing her limitations. Do people know there's a difference between Broadway and like movies? <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's not even, why well, you go to Broadway to do one of those rare shows where they don't sing? And it's like, no, mm -hmm. the, the, the waitress in Broadway is a musical. It's waitress, the musical. And yeah, if you can't sing, can't do it. You're um, on a basketball team. Why don't you play football? <laughs> <laughs> All right, enough Kerry Russell. Let's talk about somebody else. Matthew Lyland from Total Film says, A stylized indie chick flick. Waitress gets itself into a tonal puree, but still offers flavorsome pleasures and full-on food porn visuals. A funny and touching testament to Shelley's multi-talent. Savor it. This dude went hard on the food puns. And, oh, yeah. And Sounds like he's hard the way he's <laughs> describing it. He likes pie. Alex, this is a two pie movies that we've done, like, month to month, like, Back to back, uh, Labor Day and now uh, Waitress. Unfortunately, there's nothing as sensual and erotic in Waitress as the pie making scene in Labor Day. But there's <laughs> there's a visual feast you get to see every type of pie she makes. You'll at the end of Waitress, you will be hungry. Labor Day, you're not. <laughs> oh, you might be hung hungry for uh, 
uh, just love. Rolling. <laughs> yeah, just... <laughs> love overall <laughs> romantic fulfillment. Uh, but there is a scene in Waitress where Kerry Russell and Nathan Fillion are cooking together. You actually, it's a little mm -hmm. less pervy because there's no child there. Well, I mean, she's pregnant, but it's yeah, but like their fingers aren't glistening, and like the it's not the same. It's just it's a nice scene, but yeah, it's it doesn't have the same uh, carnal intent. But Nathan this is Fillion. A, Nathan Fillion doesn't say, help me put a roof on this house. Yeah. Unique as his talents are, I'm not sure he could execute that. Um, I wouldn't call this a chick flick. Just because there's women involved. I don't know. I always thought of like the prototypical chick flick because you have to have like the the Brad Pitt, you know. Um, Jerry Maguire is like the the rare blend of like great film, but you could also classify as a chick flick. Cause it, you know, it gives you the feels and shit like that. This is like, there's really no redeeming male character. Well, Matlock. Yeah. Matlock's good, but I, I don't know who's <laughs> horned up for Matlock when the movie's <laughs> over. You know, I just always, when I think of chick flick, I think the idea is that like the romantic counterpart of our lead female is supposed to endear themselves to audiences and also be like desirable. Whereas here, you know, well, I think Nathan Fillion, with all his flaws, is meant to get the audience to at least hope for uh, a sort of romantic happy ending. And I know we talk about this on the episode. Uh, I think like you're you're pulling for Carrie Russell. You're not pulling for love. Yes, you're right. Yeah, it's just that he seems like the easiest way for her to succeed. You know, it's like just hold on to this doctor. He'll pull you out of this town, and then you can just dump his ass. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think also uh, that maybe the the line has blur between chick flick and I guess what's not a chick flick, because the the battle of the sexes has kind of like calmed down, and now we all like you know Jerry Maguire is a good example. It's like Cameron Crowe is like, why would you categorize my movie as a chick flick or a sports flick? It's just a flick. <laughs> Uh, you know, I think that as years went by, men became more okay with just going to a, like a love story on film instead oh, yeah. of pretending that they're being dragged by their significant others. But it's even so. Like I, it, the reason be... I remember that about Jerry Maguire is because people were like, "I'm not watching that girl movie." I'm like, "Dude, Jerry Maguire is awesome. What the fuck are you talking about?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that uh, uh, if anything, I would call it. It, it, yeah, it, it really defies categorization in a way because you could call it a rom com, except that it's not. There's a lot of really dark shit that you wouldn't expect from a romantic comedy. So, um, yeah. I miss the days when we could call a movie a dramedy. That doesn't seem to be like really in vogue anymore. <laughs> it sounds like a drag when you call it a dramedy. Yeah, I guess so. Listeners, if you watch Waitress, and you should, so you can uh, enjoy everything that we say about it in the episode, uh, let us know. Uh, comedy, dramedy. Chick flick, everyone's flick. Ollie Richards from Empire Magazine says, an unassuming treat amid the noisy blockbuster season. It will melt your heart and any dietary resolve equally. Can you see someone just breaking their diet after? A, a treat. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, if you'd lack discipline, you're just like, I need a pie now. <laughs> I'm going to close with Lori Hoffman from Atlantic City Weekly, who says, Waitress combines the sensuality of food as love flicks like Water for Chocolate and Chocolat with Scorsese's diner classic, Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore. I am uh, ashamed to admit that I haven't seen that Scorsese movie. I've heard of Chocolat. Chocolate uh, <laughs> with Johnny Depp? Yes. Uh, never seen it. Have you seen it? Um, it's Juliette Binoche, right? Uh-huh. Yeah, maybe once. I mean, it doesn't matter. All I'll ever think of is I love you, man. That's... <laughs> chocolate. Yeah, uh, you, mean, you mean chocolate with Johnny Depp. Yeah. And then uh, I remember watching Water for uh, Water for Chocolate. Is that what it's called? <laughs> it's a, yeah, Water for Chocolate. It's based on the book. The book had recipes throughout it. And then in the movie, you hear the voiceover of how she's making the food and I don't remember how it, I just remember not liking it. Sorry. But maybe when you mix it with Chocolat and you mix it with that old Scorsese movie, then it really comes to. Alice doesn't live here anymore. Sounds familiar. Is that the one where uh, somebody goes back in time and uh, relives their high school days? Figure yeah, no, 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 no. Um, Alice doesn't live here anymore is uh, Ellen Burstein. Okay. 
So there's a couple of movies that I was thinking of. So there's no time travel in Waitress. That makes sense. And the one I'm thinking of is, thanks to the internet, I can tell you it's Peggy Sue Got Married, directed by Francis Ford Coppola, starring Kathleen Turner, not Sybil Shepard. Mm. <laughs> uh, but that's not the movie. But that one, you know, she goes back in time. Nicholas Cage. What year was that? That was... 1986. So she she goes back in time. She starts reliving her high school days. Nicholas Cage is her boyfriend uh, back then. And, uh, the only thing I remember from it is that she tries to, he's an aspiring musician, and she tries to give him the lyrics or the music or both to a Beatles song. And then he's such a fuck up that he feels the need to mess with them. So that you know, he doesn't become a hit anyway. I, I think that was it. That was the deal. Like I just remember Nicolas Cage singing a new version, and her just walking away, shaking mm. her head. None of this is relevant to Waitress, but I would tie it all together by saying that that might be considered a chick flick <laughs> and a time traveling chick uh, flick. All right, Alex. Before we go into trivia, let's uh, talk about Josh Gad. How do you fit Josh Gad in a movie that has maybe three uh, male characters in? All of them are reprehensible in one way or another. You can't make him the the love interest. And then I don't know if he has it in him to be as evil as uh, Earl in this. Yeah, <clears throat> he can't. He can't achieve the depths of uh, malice that Jeremy Sisto gets to in this movie. So you do the reasonable thing and you sit him through six hours of makeup <laughs> And you make him old, and he replaces Andy Griffith and plays the Joe character in this. <laughs> I was getting ready for you to say that he was going to be one of the waitresses. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> the only reasonable thing. But I wouldn't go that far. Um, I guess he could be the, the... I forget the character's name who kind of shows up and is dating one of the side characters. And he only has like three or four lines in the movie, but oh, he, yeah, he that can totally be Josh Gad, the the dork, yeah. uh, Augie, mm -hmm. the yeah, Augie, yeah, that's it. yeah. Uh, so yeah, I'd either say Augie or Joe. I, I'd say just lean fully into it and make Josh Gad the old guy that the, owns the the pie shop. He can have the the really like big cakey makeup, like oh yeah, like uh, Dan Aykroyd and um, nothing but <laughs> nothing trouble. But trouble. <laughs> J. Edgar is where I always go. That's my go-to. Oh, for that's... Just... Yeah. And it's shamelessly, shamelessly bad uh, makeup. Um, I like the, the idea end of, him being of that old. movie with uh, Army Hammer and Leo with like the old person makeup. It's like, what the fuck is this, man? <laughs> what am I watching? <laughs> uh, Augie. Yeah, Augie would work really well, too. Because you give him a few quick lines and, you know, kind of dorky things to say. And I'm confident that's something the gad could pull off. Yeah, I know that sometimes we like to have uh, Josh Gad stretch his muscles in this uh, segment, but I, uh, Josh Gad playing a dork that makes up his own poetry, uh, I think that that is, that is uh, the right way to go with Waitress. So you don't take No away pun intended, it. a recipe for success. <laughs> yes, a pinch of Gad. All right, Alex, hit me with some trivia. So there is a little bit of, um, you know, a pall that's cast over the discussion of this movie in regards to the director and... Uh, her untimely death. We go into detail about that in the actual episode. Don't want to spend too much time here focusing on obviously a horrific situation, but it's worth talking about when you you have to talk about it when discussing this movie, and we do so in the episode, so you can check that out there. Uh, the director was Adrian Shelley and also the writer of this movie. Uh, this went on to be a bit of a sleeper hit with a budget of $1.5 million, had a box office return of $22 million, premiered at the Sundance Film Festival on January 21st of 2007, and was released uh, in the U.S. on May 2nd of 2007, right around the time I began my job in the movie theater industry. So this may have still been in theaters when I, uh, you know, started reporting to uh, Master Cinemark. You were fresh faced. You were excited about every movie poster you walked by. Yep. I took a Spider Man 3 standee just because they were like, Do you want this? And I was like, You can just take these things. <laughs> Adrian Shelley wrote the screenplay while she was pregnant with her daughter, Sophie. Uh, Carrie Russell, obviously in the lead, and Nathan Fillion playing the, the male lead. Uh, Nathan Fillion, Julio, uh, a unique talent and someone who. Do you think it adds to the legacy of this movie that someone who's kind of viewed as like a, a cult? 
hero in some you know what's the dr horrible and Mm -hmm. um firefly and things like that do you think it adds to the legacy and intrigue of this that nathan fillion's like the the male counterpart the hunk yeah yeah i mean i also i don't think that you get much like with carrie russell uh and we we joke about this in the corner but much like with carrie russell uh, you don't see that many film vehicles for uh nathan fillion and Mm -hmm. I don't think that has anything to do with his talent. It's just the, the way the cookie crumbles. You know, I think he has the the Firefly movie, Serenity, and that might be it as far as, you know, leading roles. And so, yeah, this is, I guess, if you're a Nathan Fillion fan, this is something to treasure. <laughs> so yeah. It's him and Felicity together. Actors uh, had their fan bases that, and it comes together for, like, this real slice of life type movie that deals with very real issues very serious issues too uh, i think this speaks to our josh gad minute uh actor eddie jemison who played augie in the movie went on to also play the role in the broadway musical adaptation which Perfect. the gad the gad could do absolutely they told him i was like do you want to can you sing because k russell can't <laughs> sure yes i'll go andy griffith's second to last role of his extended acting career uh, being completely honest, I think I say this in the episode. I was like, man, he was still kicking them. Uh, so, God bless. Uh, Becky, the character smokes when in reality Cheryl Hines is a non-smoker. I've always found this interesting because obviously, like booze, most of the time in a set is going to be like O'Doul, so you're not actually ingesting alcohol, and you know these fuckers aren't actually doing cocaine and black tar heroin on the set of traffic. And, uh, but smoking isn't really something you can fake. I know there's the thing of, Oh, they have to be like herbal cigarettes. They can't be tobacco Mm -hmm. anymore on the set of movies. I don't know if that applied to this still, but like, even so you can't just, cause then it looks, it looks fake. It looks like, you know, you're pretending. So these people actually have to smoke and they have to master the inhale and the drag and all that shit. Uh, you know what I mean though? This would, that, is different than a character having to drink that doesn't drink or like you know uh, what's julia styles i don't think was free basing meth like in her <laughs> free time so um they're also not having sex when they have sex alex well Acting it depends it's a craft uh, it depends on who's behind the director's <laughs> that's chair. true so my question for you is do you think this is an underrated aspect of acting? And I know we put over Cheryl Hines, so specific to her. That is probably harder to get down than it just seems on paper. You know what I mean? Well, there's been times, and I can remember a specific instance, but there's been times where we're talking about movies, and you'll tell me, that guy's not a smoker. Like, that actor or actress, you can tell just because of the way they smoke that they, they're they not used to it. Mm-hmm. So it is definitely an aspect, I think, of a performance that you can't... You know, if you're not a smoker and your character has to smoke, then uh, I don't know. You better spend a week at least, like getting it down. <laughs> so, Hang out with Brad Pitt. He's, you know, he, I think I don't know about it anymore. For a while, I think he was one of those two packs a day guys. So just Jesus. watch Brad Pitt and see, you know, what he does. Hang out with Kevin Smith. Uh, yeah, I, I, have, I do remember you praising his his pauses, like how he knew how to deliver dialogue while smoking. Like you can tell oh, that's yeah. a guy. That's a guy that smokes. Uh, yeah, I mean, that is, uh, man, I don't know, obviously there's a gazillion reasons why I'm not an actor, but I, if they told me that I need to smoke for a part, I'll be like, but why <laughs> <laughs> can we just make him not a smoker and instead he does something else and, uh, and then I would be fired. Yeah. Let's take, get out. <laughs> Uh, can he just like frantically chew gum? That's the same. Yeah, thing, there but... you go. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think obviously we delve deeper into aspects of filmmaking and acting than normal human beings do, uh, both on and off air on a regular basis. But I just when I see stuff like that, I'm like, that is something that John and Jane Q. Public would have no like, wouldn't bat an eye or appreciate in terms of um, what these people do sometimes for their job. Uh, in a very touching note and kind of one that uh, makes me happy is it something that will live forever is the toddler who plays Lulu in the movie's final scenes is Adrian Shelley's daughter, uh, Sophie. And so, like, obviously with the uh, asterisk that comes along with that, that's kind of a touching thing to see. That's pretty sweet. Yeah. Released prints were delivered to theaters with the fake title Broken Dishes. Julio <laughs> didn't work in the projection booth as much as I did. Do you remember any? Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I don't remember. I wish I did. Like remember any of the fake titles, but I remember 
laughing because they were always, I guess, because we knew what the movie was ahead of time. So it always seemed mm-hmm. like it was really obvious. Like, let's say Iron Man would be like Metal Man or. Yeah. To to those of the uninitiated, what we're discussing is when the actual film print would get to the theater, the label on it would be something to throw off the scent of, you know, pirates and, uh, you know, any bootleggers or thieves. But like Julio said, all you had to do was like know what movie was coming out that weekend and figure it out because it wasn't, you know, like the Da Vinci Code. I remember Step Brothers was like, it was like grown kids or like... <laughs> big boys or something like it was something like just really silly i mean the serious fucking you know big time movies usually had like padlocks and shit on them that Mm -hmm. the studio would send you a combination for but you can just see those uh criminals like the bootleggers breaking into the movie theater in the middle of the night they get to the can because they're looking for stepbrothers they're like (laughs) big big men big boys (laughs) fuck (laughs) walk away we're we're too late (laughs) And lastly, for Waitress, uh, this film was shot in 20 days. Again, kind of like that smoking thing. Uh, At least when I was younger, I thought movies just took like years to make. And, you know, in some (laughs) cases they do. A movie like this that does deal with like serious uh, real life situations. That's that is a job. And these people probably go through taxing emotional shit like Carrie Russell having to go through all this shit in 20 Mm -hmm. days is uh, is probably. um, you know, it's something I can't relate to because I'm not an actor. Uh, Julio, what this is like, Julio, I want to use this to ask you a question. What do you think the most exhaustive and emotionally draining role in 20 days would be? We talking like Liam Neeson and uh, Schindler's <laughs> List? Like, what are we talking here? We already have an answer, Alex. The world already has an answer. That is uh, John Connor in Terminator Salvation. <laughs> That's the role that broke Christian Bale. I don't know. He was doing it in 20 days. I think it yeah. broke him in like, you know, two months or whatever. What the fuck are you doing? <laughs> Do I want? No. No. Don't shut me up. What don't you fucking understand? No. No. What don't you fucking understand? Yeah, I, I guess that's we have it readily available, and that was just a year after this. Carrie Russell called him to warn him, so like, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> also, I mean, I guess if we're going just into the classics, uh, did Martin Sheen have a heart attack doing Apocalypse Now? <laughs> yes, <laughs> that movie, I mean, took forever. Can you imagine if Coppola had been like, we can do it in 20 days? <laughs> and the the kid who played spider in way of water was just like, end this, please. (laughs) (laughs) He's like, I've been going into the grocery store and growling at people. I need to be done with this role. (laughs) All right. So waitress. Yeah. Obviously like apocalypse now, it doesn't have a, a rich history and tapestry of interesting behind the scenes facts, but it's an interesting movie and it lends itself to interesting discussion. Yeah, and again, I would like to uh, underscore how uh, helpful, beneficial it was to have a third person that was not a dude <laughs> join oh. for this movie. It was it was great because it's, it's a movie that uh, I'm not discounting our opinions of the things that we brought to the table, but it was just so nice to have uh, a woman come in and just give us – and also somebody that was very familiar with the movie. So she obviously yeah. had been thinking about it, and it really – don't want to spoil too much about the episode, but uh, – my rating changes by the time, you know, from the moment that we begin the recording to when we end, from when we get in Contreras Corner to when we finish Real Talk, I, I had a a change of heart about something. So exciting stuff. Uh, it would have been very unbalanced to not have a female perspective, so I'm glad we do. <laughs> Just the two of us siding with Nathan Fillion the entire time. Yeah. Look at Just this girl. To, playing yeah. with his heart. <laughs> Just go buy some Plan B and it's done, man. Get it over with. <laughs> All right. Well, so that'll be Waitress. As we said, check out the movie, check out the episode, and then get ready because after that, uh, the the patron takeover continues with a 0% movie. Uh, Jason is bringing us the movie Dark Crimes, a uh, Jim Carrey vehicle that I didn't even know existed. So get ready for that. Uh, once we get there, uh, well, I mean, we've done a 0% before. And, it's and, free on YouTube, Pluto, Tubi, Voodoo. They're trying to give this movie away. Please watch it and talk about it on your podcast. 
It's also I didn't realize it has Charlotte uh, Gainsbourg in it. She's the she's the Leslie Mann for <laughs> Lars von Trier, right? <laughs> I, if if that's the case, I feel bad for her. I mean, I think that she is maybe she's more like his Robert De Niro. Oh, okay. I, I don't think that there's a romantic entanglement there. Oh yeah, duh. that's. I, I wasn't trying to conflate the two. Yeah, <laughs> De, De Niro to uh, to Scorsese. Scorsese. Yeah, yeah, we can we can go roll with that. All right. Well, so be ready for that. Definitely watch Waitress, and that uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Take care. Oh, no. No, don't you fucking-